Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. It is not our abilities that show what we truly are. It is our choices. Hello and welcome to Jen Taylor Rerouting, where being rude is never acceptable, but sarcasm is welcome and swearing isn't always a bad option. Let's get started. Welcome to Jen Taylor Rerouting. Today I am uh, really happy to invite and uh, welcome Neil Moore. Neil, how are you today? I'm great, Jen. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. So, Neil, you uh, started the Simply Music Institution, and we can find you on simplymusic.com, which is a pretty outstanding site. Thank you. Um, I played around on there and cyberstalked you and watched videos and all kinds of stuff. So I know that your story will resonate with a lot of people because, um, and you're going to have to jump in and correct me on some of this. You were born in 57 in Melbourne, Australia. Yeah. So you have an accent, which I always, I always, we think in America that if you have an accent, you're sexy. It's sexy to have an accent until I realized if I'm talking to someone with an accent, I have an accent. So. That would really be the case. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I speak in my native tongue, right, Australian, but I've been living in the United States for 23 years, so I don't even hear the American accent. I get back, and I travel a lot constantly, actually. Right. And I get back to Australia pretty regularly. And where I'm most aware of the Australian accent is when I go to LAX and I'm getting on the plane and, you know, the, uh, the airline assistants flying to Australia have got Australian accents and all of a sudden it's like, wow, there's a whole bunch of Australians and I listen to them speak and I go, oh, it's so cute. <laughs> it sounds so funny. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, in LA. So you're in LA, that was another thing. And you, you did, you moved here in 94, born in 57 in Melbourne. Yeah. Turn 94. Yeah. What brought you to the U.S.? Um, well, the the short story of what brought me here was that uh, I came here with an idea. So, um, although professionally I've had a, a varied career um, up until 25 years ago, um, I've always belonged to music. So I had an a, 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 an affinity to music that was very, very evident in my first months of life. By 12 months of age, um, it was already an affinity that was being very highly expressed. Um, as an adult, I discovered that I had a particular perspective uh, that's, that's unique. I hear music and I see two and three dimensional shapes. And I discovered that I have a way of communicating it to people that allows them to see music as I do. And in that process, it just completely transforms how quickly and easily people are able to learn how to play you know, comparatively sophisticated music. And I felt that this was something that really had the possibility of revolutionizing, completely transforming. Uh, music education on a global basis and uh, I came here to the United States to launch the program from here and uh, you know it's grown now into a multinational music education institution and you know, we're in 13 countries we have educators at about 800 locations around the world it's, right so it's just a little one we're just getting started I mean I'm yeah. just 25 years into this I still truly experience it as an absolute startup yeah well and it's not I mean it's grown exponentially Exponentially, uh, 800 locations in 13 countries is huge. Now, you were born, I think, uh, five kids in seven years your parents had. You're one of five? Yeah, I'm one of five. I'm the youngest of five. Um, my, I, my parents were incredible, beautiful. I was born into a beautiful family. Very musical. Um, well, yeah, my, my father was a singer. My mother was a music lover. She'd had, you know, very few, some lessons as a child, but she didn't really play. It wasn't an active uh, participational experience, but she, was, she loved listening to music and she loved jazz and blues. And so there was always jazz and blues and Ella Fitzgerald and Ray Charles and, you know, playing in the home all the time. My father was a tenor, but he, he loved big band music and Sinatra and... Uh, but as each of us turned seven, at least for the four boys, uh, my sister chose to do allocution, which is, you know, the art and science of speech. But for each of the four brothers, we began piano lessons at seven years of age. And so by the time I was born, there were already music lessons going on in the home. So I was born into that environment where music was not only being generally played in the house all the time, but it was also being learned and practiced every day. 
And so I think that that immersion, uh, that type of an immersion in music had a, an enormous impact on my uh, connection. So you said you saw the music. You Tell me about what it was like for you when you started your lessons. Well, I, well, there's just a little piece of information prior to that that would be relevant. I was about three, and bear in mind, this part of the story, it's... Um, it's more so a matter of me now looking back retrospectively and explaining it. Because at the time, I was, it was quite invisible to me. It was very, very organic. But I was about three or four years of age. And I remember my father playing some big band music. And I could hear, you know, the trumpets playing. And, you know, they were sort of playing up and, you know, moving on to the next note and coming back to this note. And as they were moving up and down and, and back, I, I could picture it as this sort of triangle. And... As they would play, as I familiarised myself with the song, I would see it in terms of these shapes. And that was just my relationship. I didn't think anything of it. wasn't even thinking about it. It's just the way that it occurred for me. Um, and so then when I began studying piano at the age of seven, my teacher would play the song that I was going to be learning. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I can, I can see that shape as he's playing from that white note to the black note to the white note and then coming back. That's that one of those triangle shapes. And so, so that was sort of my experience. And I mean, like my, old, my older brothers who all learned, you know, the, the right way, the traditional way of learning how to read music, which is really the, the predominant global approach, you know, what I call a reading based approach, you learn how to read music and your ability to read music dictates your ability to play, which is a dinosaur and bankrupt, by the way, but getting back to the point, the, uh, the, the, I had zero interest just looking at the page of music. I, it, it was all black and it looked like barbed wire. There was nothing inv inviting about it. It didn't make sense to me. In fact, it intimidated me. I saw no point and I experienced no point because I could hear the music and recall it and I could see the shapes and patterns and during the week I'd just figure it out. And then come my piano lesson, which became sort of a traumatic experience because I always thought I was doing something wrong in not learning the right way. Uh, you know, come Friday night and my lessons the next morning, it's like, is this the week that I'm going to get caught, you know, found out that I'm not reading? And I didn't realize my teacher knew all along. And so Saturday for my lesson, I would just sit there staring blankly at the page, playing based completely on, you know, reconstructing these shapes and patterns and thinking that if I just look at the page, he's sitting there, he'll think that I'm reading music and he didn't say anything. And it was like, whew, like this huge relief for me. What, oh, yeah. I, what I didn't know is that he'd gone out to my mother it, right at the beginning when this was happening saying, Neil's not reading. He's just pretending. He thinks he's fooling me. But fortunately, my mother said, I know, but like, listen to him play. Just, I, just, I think you should just leave him alone. Just let him do his own thing. I didn't know they'd made that agreement. I'm grateful that now, because of what happened as a result, but it was nonetheless, it was a traumatic experience for me. Yeah, I understand. I, I went to uh, three months three whole months of piano lessons. I think I was 12 or 13 and it was an older woman. She was very rigid and very old school and I didn't like her and I didn't like going and I love music. Same thing as you, grew up in a family filled with music. So that was a very great memory. Victrola's playing and I couldn't read music but I could go home and bang it out. I didn't see the shapes like you do but I think learning that way makes sense to me and you I don't think you would have ever said anything because there was nothing quote wrong with you. It's just how it was just your perception. You wouldn't have even known to mention it. You could have assumed that everybody sees music the way you did at that point in time. Certainly when I started, I knew all my brothers was, were seeing music their way because they, they were just reading what was on the page. And uh, so you took your lessons and fortunately your mom and the piano teacher had this agreement and you were allowed to see music. So when did you, how old were you? When did you put the pieces together that you yeah. saw things differently? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I had this way of learning music. It was always a source of shame for me. I've, I've sort of had a behavioral addiction to shame since a very, very early age. In fact, I think most addiction, we often tend to, to, um, attempt to address the behavior rather than the underlying uh, addiction to the neurochemistry uh, associated with the feelings that underscore the behavior. It's a separate conversation. Happy to talk about that. But, um, <clears throat> I, uh, so I had this way of doing things and I sort of did it my way. I was always embarrassed about it. I didn't even let schoolmates know that I played piano because I was terrified of going to their home. And if they had a piano and the parents knew I 
learn piano and they pulled out some music and said, I'll play something. You know, anywhere I went where there was an instrument was an opportunity for me to be found out. So there was, was always, always um, a relentless experience, uh, a visceral experience of shame associated with my relationship with music. And yet it was, it was really where I belonged. I belonged to music. It was a place where I could, uh, I could go to and disappear into. And I developed, by the time I was 12 or 13, um, I was playing a repertoire of contemporary and classical and you know, gospel and blues, and I was composing pieces, and, uh, but I couldn't read a note of music at all, didn't know anything about math, the math of music or the theory. I mean, I just, all I knew was my way of doing things and, and the belief that that was the wrong way and that, that if I was found out, I'd get into trouble. <clears throat> so it remained a largely hidden experience. And uh, one of the reasons why I've never really been a public performing artist um, but uh, I, I went to numerous music teachers. I, I always felt like it would help me if I knew more about music. I went to numerous, I, I, my first teacher I learned from the age of seven to 15, so it was eight years. And then from 15 until um, my early 30s, I had lots of different teachers, but it was a very unpleasant experience. Two things would happen. They'd either hear me play and go, wow, he's really good. And they'd give me stuff that, that I didn't know anything about it and I had no comprehension of it at all and couldn't understand it. Or they'd say, okay, well, if you don't know the basics, I've got to take you back to the beginning. And they'd put me back in the beginning like Mary had a little lamb, one note on a page. It's like, why am I doing this when I can actually even play more better than you can play? Uh, you know, I, I just didn't like the experience. So I, there was also this sort of experience of being a failure around that. But, and so a lot of my um, emotional experience related to music was this, this genetic certainty that I belonged to music, this emotional longing to be musically self-expressed, expressed, and the psychological shame about my whole relationship to it. So those things are inseparable for me. So actually, I'm completely grateful for it because of what it allowed me to do. I wouldn't have been able to develop what I developed if it wasn't for all of those three things. And you did still take music in, but then you also were a business major in college. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't go to school. I hated school passionately. I love <laughs> learning and I was devout and passionate in how much I hated school. I went to good schools. You know, I went to, my parents were in a position to afford to put me in really good schools and I hated it and I was sort of like house angel street devil I was always um articulate I love people I've always been friendly and polite um that's always been an exterior you know I've always sort of been terrified of the world I've always felt sort of separated from the world um but I used my intellect my articulation um my social skills etc to feign competence and confidence um which is a common manifestation for you know, for people that have had uh, trauma experiences in childhood. So let's, let's go back. Let's dive into that. You talked about addiction to shame and trauma and yeah. that dissociation. So where did that come from? Um, well, I, uh, I had a, a completely innocent experience at five years of age. Um, just a totally inexperienced, you know, a totally innocent experience where I, I, um, my, I was just lying with my mother one night and she moved my hand and I thought I'd done something wrong. This is how extraordinary it is for me that, that there are people that have gone through massive, horrific, traumatic events and they flourish in spite of them and other people can have the most innocuous experiences. And yet it occurred for me in that moment that I had done something very wrong and I didn't know what it was, but that was the moment where I became conscious of my existence. I went from just being a child out in the world to this, like suddenly I just, I've done something wrong. I don't know what it is. I, I remember feeling the hot flush of shame, embarrassment, you know, that the, the chemistry flood, that flood dose of neurochemistry um, of, having done something wrong, but I didn't know what it was. And, um, and I can see that, uh, I'm sorry if I bounce around a little bit because the pieces didn't come together in a linear manner. This was like a jigsaw puzzle that I constructed over my lifetime. Um, really from that point onwards, 
I, I can see that I made a decision about the world. Like there is, I could be doing something wrong in the world at any given moment. And I don't, and I may not even know what it was terrified at the thought of that because that that emotional experience i had was a horrible nauseous unpleasant hot experience it was like i was terrified of re-experiencing it but i also made a decision about myself you know that duality of that decision when these things happen we make a decision about the world and about ourselves and for me the decision i made is that i'm bad and so um what in retrospect what i see happens in these experiences uh, i i've never met anyone uh who has escaped this, but we have experiences, we make decisions about ourselves and about the world. Those decisions um, are associated with extraordinarily complex neurochemistry that burns very, very deep neural pathways. Uh, when we make these decisions about the world and ourselves, the world and ourselves now begin to be filtered through that lens. And so not only do we re-experience ourselves as being bad and doing the wrong thing, but every time we do, we keep flushing the, the, the body and the brain with that neurochemistry. It occurs at an age when language is in a high state of development, the body's in a high state of development, the brain's in a very high state of development. And when that neurochemistry, like the, the cortisol and the adrenaline associated with shame, are so prevalent in the brain, the brain begins, begins to normalize that. And it sees the presence of that chemistry almost being necessary to homeostasis. And the brain must cause, it must have behavior uh, that, that fuels that chemistry in order to feed, to feed the addiction to the chemistry. And so what happened is that I would always just live, always making sure that as sweet as I was and as nice as I was, I would shoplift and I would do, you know, I would break windows deliberately. I'd do stupid things at school. I, I just would misbehave enough to get consequences that reaffirmed the fact that I knew that, that I could be doing something wrong, that I was doing something wrong and that I was a bad boy. Wow. So you're feeding the beast. I believe that that's the state of, of human you know, humanity. I think this is what happens for human beings, that, uh, that a lot of the behavior that we're trying to work on, uh, oftentimes, you know, well, I'll give you, you know, over my lifetime, I've had long-term excessive and inappropriate relationships with alcohol, with marijuana, uh, with narcotics and food. Um, and, where it became confounding for me, um, it was coupled with a few things. I think about four when I, I first started to be fascinated with euphoria, I discovered I could just sort of spin in circles and then I could spin and spill until my dizziness sort of, you know, would knock me flat on my back and I'd lie there looking at the clouds and I just remembered this sensation of the dizziness and how uh, fascinated I was and how I loved that experience and when I would return to normalize I'd stand up and spin around and spin around and until I just got dizzy and I'd lie there I I loved that euphoria and in school my friend and I played this hyperventilation game where we discovered that if we hyperventilated enough and then put it he's put, put his arms around me and bear hug me I would literally pass out go into unconsciousness but when I came back to consciousness there was this experience of of this dreamy world and I mean, I don't know what brain damage I was doing, but we were just doing that all the time. And then by 13, it came, uh, by the age of 13, it had turned into these sort of alcohol weekends where kids from school would get together and, you know, we'd drink a few cans of beer and just walk around really buzzed. And, um, you know, I wasn't like I was drinking every day or anything like that, but to just to that sensation, I pursued that. And uh, at 18, um, I started smoking marijuana. And I, I mean, the day that I started, the euphoria of that was, um, I mean, I was just, it was every day for years, like every day. And uh, it had sort of uh, all sorts of consequences. And then really from that age onwards, 18 through really up until even more recent years, um, I've, I've had, uh, you know, my relationship with alcohol has always been excessive. Um, I don't drink to get drunk. I don't drink to pass out. I drink to buzz, but I do it the next night and the next night and the next night and the next night. And there's always guilt. It's like, I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be doing this. But what I discovered was that I used to think, gosh, is this an addiction? But I discovered it's like, I've got to stop. And I would just stop drinking. And I, could, I would stop drinking for years at a time. And I wouldn't even think about it. So it wasn't as if I had to work at it ever. 
It wasn't that I had to sort of resist the urge, not at all. I would stop. And when, I'm, when I was drinking, I couldn't imagine not drinking. And when I'm not drinking, I couldn't imagine even drinking. It was zero issue for me. And I thought, why is it if part, one of the definitions, I mean, I know, I know the world of addiction is changing dramatically at the moment. There's so many people working on a new platform and redefining the whole conversation about addiction. But if at that time, if one of the prevailing interpretations of the definition of alcohol was a physical uh, compulsion combined with a mental obsession and a diminishing of responsibilities, I had no physical compulsion, no mental obsession. I just stopped the behavior. But then I, what I found is that, you know, I'd, I'd stop drinking and I'd feel better and I'd start exercising and I'd be exercising, but then I'd be overeating and I think, and I just think I shouldn't be overeating as much. I'm putting on weight. So I'd stop overeating, but then I'd be overspending and then I'd stop overspending, but then I would be back drinking again and then I'd stop drinking. And it's like, why is it that I can stop any activity or any behavior with absolute ease and yet I seem to displace it onto something else that can be oftentimes completely disconnected. There's got to be a connection. I thought maybe it's not an addiction. Maybe it's what I call chronic habitual overuse. It's chronic, it's habitual, and it's certainly overuse. But it occurred to me at one point of time, you know what? If I'm drinking and then I stop and then I'm not exercising, but then I'll start exercising, but I'll be overspending, or then I won't be saving, or then I won't be working hard enough, or then I'll be eating too much. I started to see that what was always prevalent was still the presence of whatever the activity was that I should be doing or shouldn't be doing. I was always ashamed of that. And I started to think, well, I, gosh, I remember that experience of shame. The moment it started, it was such a physical flush. I, got, I developed an interest in knowing a little bit more about the neurochemistry of shame and its impact on the brain. And, um, you know, separate from my work with Simply Music, I spent, I have a lot of opportunity to, coach people in the areas of their growth and behavior. And I started to consider, I wonder if, the, if there is a deeper, more prevalent underlying issue here um, where the behavior that is considered to be addictive is actually a solution and what might, might, might there be a subset of solutions that it's, that it's providing an answer to. And it's, so as I started to look through that lens, I mean, I understand none of this is the truth. This is to me is just one model of interpretation, right? Um, as I looked at this and I started to look at it for myself, I started to see it, it was crystal clear for me that the addiction wasn't at all, had nothing to do with the actual, it wasn't the weed or the alcohol or the food or whatever. It was the chemical that I have a, a tier two addiction to is the neurochemistry of shame. And if that is the case, where might that be prevalent? So I identified in my life what I call behavioral shame centers, areas of my life where I've developed an expertise and a mastery in extracting shame from. My relationship with food or with alcohol or with exercise or with money or with my, uh, my vision, my musicianship, you know, you know, relationships. I could see that my actions, in this instance, the actions including things I do as well as things that I don't do, that my actions always made sure as much as I could separate for, from myself from any particular area of behavior, what I had never separated myself from was feeding my body with the new neurochemistry of shame. And that was a life changer for me when I began to start to look at my world through, you know, would I be willing to just consider that this might be true? Would I be able to try it on just like a pair of glasses, look at my life through that lens and would it offer me any insight, which I, I'm not a high a big fan of, but more so would it offer me an insight that actually pulled me into action? Could it give me some power, some freedom that I had not previously, previously had access to? And that became a life changer. I lost, I lost 80 pounds in, you know, several months and took up yoga and reconnected back with my musicianship. I, I mean, when I'm talking about my musicianship, this is my own personal playing. I mean, I got into Simply Music for my music. 
But as it grew into this thing, it became about me being in the business of being in business and running this multinational organization. That's the way that it looks. But the reality of it was that it was the perfect excuse for me to not play and work on my own musicianship. And so my pianos, and I make sure that I have them in sight in everywhere in my office and home, they become fantastic shame centers because they just, the pianos are just sitting there saying, why aren't you playing me? Why aren't you playing me? You should be doing this. You know, you should be doing this. So, you know, like most humans, I'm not so much interested in solving my problems. I'm interested in having them because of what they provide that underscores the issue, you know? I think it's fantastic that you just said that out loud. I, I think that's true and we just don't recognize it or want to admit it. So my question is that feeling at five years old was overwhelmingly negative. And yes. you, you fed the beast, you created it by being, becoming the bad boy, so to speak. And by continuing to do things that made you continue to feel a way that you didn't like to feel. Correct. So why? Well, uh, you know, I think that it's not even so much, uh, I don't even think that this is at the level of choice. I think it's really more a matter of if we get back to, this, to the earlier state of what I said before, that when we, when we have, uh, you know, typically these decisions that we make about ourselves occur as a result of an incident. There are lots of subsequent compounding incidents, but it begins with an incident. It always happens at a, at a, a, a young age. I know that there's a great deal of work and, uh, and there's a lot being understood now about the impact of, um, of our wound experience on our lives. There's a, a tremendous impact on, uh, from the birth experience on our lives, from the immediate post-birth experience on our lives. Um, but clearly there are extraordinary impacts that uh, our very earliest experiences have. Uh, and, and some of those defining experiences, the defining incidents, almost always occur at a young age, three, four, five, six, at a stage when, the langu when our language is, a, is in a very high state of development, when our neurology is in a very high state of development, and in the body is a very high state of development. I mean, you know, language is used as a, it has a separating function. You know, it allows us to be able to separate red from green or dog from cat or you from me. What we don't pay a lot of attention on is the role that language has played in separating us from ourselves. And so um, one of the things that happens when an incident occurs and we make a decision, uh, we're not really conscious in that moment that that decision occurs in language and that language has an unpleasant experience. And when we make that decision about I am a particular way, it's as if we now have, we create these physiological, biological contact lenses that are going to see the world. I, at no stage do I believe it's like, hey, this was a crappy feeling. I'm going to choose this next time. It, to me, it doesn't really work that way. It, it comes as a result uh, of you know, that I made a decision. That decision was, was uh, combined with such a powerful chemical response that it forms almost this. I know this is entirely conceptual, but that it, it forms almost a biological lens that I made a decision that I'm bad. And that I didn't, don't know, you know, didn't know what I was doing. And, and there was that fear and that trauma. And it was a horrible experience. But I'm bad. And now I don't want that experience. So I'm on guard from that experience. And it's sort of like this, that, you know, when you and I are walking down the street, we're not walking on, down the street on guard that a lion's going to jump out and attack us, right? Because we know that there aren't lions in town when we're walking around the street. So the only way we can really protect ourselves from a threat is to make sure that that threat always feels like it's present. If you and I were in Africa in the long, hot grass, and we knew there were hungry lions, we would be on guard. So the brain will only put itself in a state of alert for something if it feels that threat is there. So it has to have the threat there in order to believe that it's protecting itself from that threat. But the outcome of that is that it ensures that in protecting myself from the threat, the fear that the threat is there, the belief that I'm deserving of the threat because I'm bad, hand in hand with that, in the biological function, it's delivering neurochemistry in the body. And when that chemistry is present for so long, the body believes that that's a necessary chemical in order to achieve homeostasis. Got it. Okay. I like the way you described that. I'm sorry, in, I, I in can't order. ask questions in a few words. I take a long time. No, this, that's great. This is fantastic, Neil. Don't ever apologize. I love it. So <clears throat> when did you really, really recognize and admit, okay, this is me 
creating the, these, I'm creating this. I'm going from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. And you decided you didn't want to do that anymore. Oh, it was only in more recent years, only the last few years. And it wasn't so much that I didn't want to do it anymore. So I, I need to just go back. I've, I've always been aware. I've needed to be aware of the behavior. I've always talked about the behavior isn't okay. Um, I'm not, you know, that I have shame with it. But my attempts to address it were always, it, oh gosh, can I go with this another way? Do you mind? Yep, nope, go ahead. Let's, let's say this is a circle and let's, let's call this circle a problem. Now this problem could be the totality of my life or it could be any, any particular problem that I'm dealing with. Let's just call it, it's a problem. And inside the problem, there would be the description of the problem. I could say, let me tell you about the problem. Now, uh, when I look at any problem, I can really oversimplify this and I can say really any problem has two parameters to it. Any problem is either something that I want that isn't happening or something that I don't want that is happening. And it can actually be both. Let's say I'm in a relationship and I'm being mistreated. I'm in this relationship. I'm being mistreated. Here are all the ways that I'm mistreated. I don't deserve this. You know, we've got the whole story about it. But ultimately, it could be like, there's something that I want, and that's like to be treated nicely, and that's not happening. Or something that I don't want, I don't want to be treated badly, and it is happening. So really, it's the same thing. But typically, if we now start to look at the want, that those wants also have a whole subset of dialogue. And that whole subset of dialogue not only includes, you know, the, the, the want that isn't happening or the don't want that is, but it also includes that, you know, I never get what I wanted and it isn't like this and it's always been like that. There's this whole other story about the want. It's almost like there's the news on the screen, television screen, and there's, there's, the, there's the little subtext that's printed across the bottom that's just scrolling. That's like us. We've got our story, but underneath there's this subset of dialogue. And to me, there's great resource to be found in there. Because when I started to analyze that, I, I started to see for myself that that subset of the wanting and it not happening or the not wanting and it sorry, the wanting and not happening or the not wanting and it actually being happening, I found that that was prevalent regardless of what the problem was. I could pluck in alcohol or I weed or narcotics or food or my musicianship or my money, financial position or my business. It wouldn't matter what I could plug it in. I could see, ah, want that's not or don't want that is. And then there's the whole story. And in that story, there's that same thing. And that same thing leads to this underlying chemistry of shame. That, that, that insight for myself, that part of it, that bottom part, which I call the under the radar part, mm -hmm. that only happened in more recent years. Prior to that, I was trying to reinterpret the problem, address the problem, or change my wants, or maybe I need to communicate my wants, or maybe I need to renegotiate my wants, or I need to be more flexible with my wants, or maybe what I need to do is you know, get out of that situation as if that was actually the problem, and I'm dealing with it all up here, not seeing that, hey, if I don't get that this is all, none of it's a problem, all of it's a solution to providing the chemistry that's feeding the addiction. If I don't get that, then all I'm gonna do is get out of that situation and just plug it in with another. Or there might be one big one and I'll just solve that, but I'll you know, plug in a bunch of whole smaller ones. But either way, I'm gonna be left with wants that aren't fulfilled or not wants that are. And that's gonna leave me feeling a particular way. And there's a neurochemistry to that feeling. And it doesn't matter what I do in my life, that chemistry is present. huh? I wonder if that's where the addiction lies. In the chemistry. Taking that on, interpreting that as an addiction and taking on that has been incredibly difficult. That is like the nemesis of biblical proportions. <laughs> so what do you do with that? So you, I mean, you realize it and that you're breaking it down and the wanting and not getting or the don't wanting and getting. And then, so still though, no matter how you're looking at addiction or not addiction or chemistry, how do you rectify that? Um, well, I, I wonder if this won't be a lifelong quest. Mm -hmm. I'm perfectly happy for it to be a lifelong quest. Um, I found that attempts to take on the big gorillas guarantee the persistence of the issue. So we're talking about the presence of a chemistry in the brain. And as far as the brain is concerned, that is necessary. So that up here, I talked about the wants. Down here, we're talking about needs. So let's distinguish that. A want, okay, it's a desire. A need is critical to existence. 
at the level of the brain, brain body, this chemistry, as far as my amygdala is concerned, is absolutely critical. And any attempt to, to remove the chemistry, that present, the presence of that chemistry from the brain, the brain will interpret as literally a life-threatening event. And in, it, in every instance, I believe, will outwit, out-strategize, outlast, and outplay if you don't understand the nature of the beast. It, it will fool you by allowing you to solve big problems and you now think, great, I'm over that big problem. If we think that the problem was the problem, if we don't see that it was the chemistry, we're not looking for where else did I take the chemistry because it was my drug dealer, where did I take that, the, the drugs that I was getting from that dealer and now I've just spread it out from a bunch of little street corner dealers. We're not looking for that. So part of this, this take, I have found for myself and, and in working with others with this, that it takes a very, very high level, developing a high level of sensitivity to the presence of this chemistry, what, what triggers the chemistry. It takes a very high level of consciousness to starting to see where that behavior is the, is the behavior that actually um, generates the chemistry and that it's disguised by creating a predicament, a life predicament that looks as though there's a problem and a want and a don't want and has the attention like focusing on on the movie as though you're watching the movie, not seeing your projector creating it in the first place to solve the problem. So high, very high level of sensitivity, very high level of consciousness, a very high level of compassion for yourself, that you're just truly just a child of God that was hurt, that made a decision at a time when a body and a brain was in formulation and as part of the human experience, you took on a belief symptomatically creates a chemical that your brain has now developed a neurochemical addiction to. I call it a tier two addiction, tier one to the identity itself. <clears throat> Did you ever go back and discuss any of this with your mom? I've discussed the incident with my mom, but it's sort of, it, it's, um, I, I've thanked, like I've thanked my mother, but this is not a, an, an, at 90 years of age, I would not even want the possibility of my mother thinking that she did anything that caused me harm. And I don't even see that. I wouldn't change one leaf on one tree. I am so, so grateful. Because what happened to me was that music was one of those places where I could just sort of disappear to, you know, as a child. And I was able to develop this faculty and this, you know, this relationship, this perspective. And if I hadn't developed that, well, here I am now, you know, I've contributed musical self-expression to just hundreds of thousands of people all over the world and i'm just getting started it's interesting to me that you took your love of music and your ability to escape into it which is the perfect way to word it um and you gave that gift to other people and so you're well, that's a purpose thing, you know? what's that that to me is a purpose thing I mean, we get into a whole other conversation there about god and well, but it was a purpose. And so I think that I want to go in so many directions right now, but you, you were teaching music, but you were approached by a family with a blind child that was seven or eight. Yeah. yeah. I'd gotten into, uh, in Australia, um, I had, uh, I came from a family of business people and none of the five kids, you know, went to, uh, to college. Um, our, well, it was never even really discussed going to college or not going to college. We just grew up in an environment where there was a self-employed environment and there were business people. And if you need someone with a degree or something, you would hire that person. It was just never really thought of. So I got into um, uh, the restaurant industry, actually. I owned restaurants in Australia. And, and really, the intention all along was, can I get into business and do well enough early enough and, and quickly enough so that I can just retire into music. And I didn't even know what that would look like or what that meant. All I knew is that I just wanted to be doing music. It was really vague. Um, but I, I got into business and I was successful at that. And, um, but you know, it's a strange thing to be successful, you know, very successful and very unsatisfied. And to try to rationalize satisfaction. I should be happy. I've got a beautiful wife, beautiful children, successful business, great home, don't want for anything. You know, I've got a great business. It's fantastic. I should be satisfied. Well, I'm not. Okay, well, maybe the answer is to get another business. So I buy another business. And there'd be a challenge and I'd be inversed, you know, like invested in it and then I'd elevate above it. And it's like, um, Empty, not empty, just unsatisfied. 
so longing you, unfulfilled. Longing unfulfilled. Were you ever trying to figure out, and you were, in the meantime, you have pot or alcohol or money or food or all of these other things. You feel like it was a constant need to try to find some sort of fulfillment. Was that at all part of that? Um, oh, there's no, there's no question that there was a, a, a pain in longing unfulfilled. Um, and that there was clearly um, a, my coping, one of my coping mechanisms was sedation. Uh, except for those times when I would have, it's like, ah, oh, look, you know, I shouldn't be doing this, you know, and I'd stop drinking and I wouldn't have a drink for 10, 12, 13 years. I wouldn't even think about it. And I could go out to people and smell their wines. I've, you know, I worked in the wine industry, know sort of a bit about wine. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't even occur to me that, hey, have a mouthful or want to have a mouthful or be looking to have a mouthful. It's just like, no, I'm just a no. When I'm a no, I'm just devout to the no. And when I'm yes, I'm a devout to the yes. And it was sort of like those times, uh, what, I, what I see now was how I was replacing it with other behavior that was still shame generating. I didn't right. see that as clearly at the time. Um, but, but the truth of the matter was, regardless, I was unsatisfied and I'd gotten out of the restaurant industry and I'd bought into another business and um, there, there was a stock market crash of the late uh, 1980s and, and we just went through, we lost everything. We went through a bankruptcy in that time. And in Australia, when you go through a bankruptcy, in the United States, if you go through a bankruptcy, you can keep a lot of things. In Australia, you lose everything. They'll take your cars and your home and in anything you have of any value. And, and we lost everything. And that was a fantastic experience for me. I had two things happen. One particular day where these two things occurred. I mean, when I say bankrupt, I literally mean like I open the fridge and my three children standing there and there's no food, nothing to feed anybody with. So having to go to out, you know, to, uh, you know, a, a pawn shop and sell my wedding jewelry in order to get enough food to buy food for the children. I mean, it, we were broke. Um, and there was this particular day where um, in Australia, a lot of, some, a lot of holes, homes are sold by auction. And they put these, they nail these big boards at the front of your property saying there's a forthcoming auction. And there's these photos of your home and there's all the you know, details about the, you know, the inside of the home and then a, a phone number to contact the, uh, the realtor, the real estate agent. And if you want to inspect the home, you can go in and check it out. But the, the homes are auction. And on the day of the auction, an auctioneer comes and they get out their little their pedestal and their gavel and the cars come in and all these people crowd around the house and they there's a public auction and they bid to sell the home right so it's, it's a really dynamic experience sorry for the segue um and uh on this particular day there were, these men were out there putting the big board up to sell our home and there was a truck taking away our cars and i remember having this moment where i saw wow they're taking everything i have and they're taking nothing of me and it was just distinct that what I have is not me and what I have is whole and intact. That was like a boom moment. And then immediately after that, I just saw my life as an equation. It's like, oh, I've been pursuing money in order to do what I love. Broken equation. From this day forward, I'm going to pursue what I believe that I was meant to do. And... If there's any truth to the rumor that the universe aligns itself or that God has his way with those who commit, I don't, whatever version of it is, if there's any truth to that, if this is the path that I'm called to be on, if I get onto this path and commit myself, then let's see if the world aligns itself to support that happening. Uh, I, I just had some miracles occur, literally miraculous things occur um, that, uh, brought me to pursuing music. And at that time I thought, gosh, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be doing music, I don't know anything that all those real musicians know. They know theory and the math and the reading. I better study that. So I began formal studies um, at, um, you know, like weekend classes at uh, one of our music colleges. And I didn't have a piano. I'd lost my piano in the bankruptcy. And I thought somebody I know has got to have a piano that they're not using because every, almost everyone who has a piano doesn't use it. Uh, 
And so I called this woman that I knew and she said, what are you doing? And I told her, she said, my brother's teaching this reading program that he developed about reading music. You should do one of his courses. And I did his course and he wanted to expand. And I had a certain knowledge about expanding a business. And also I just got his approach and I trained with him to become a teacher and I began teaching music and it was a life-changing experience. I was, I got very, very busy, very, very quickly. And, uh, I knew that I, that I was on the right path. I came over to the United States and I was teaching this other person's method, which was a reading based method, a traditional method. And I got a reputation as being a successful teacher. And I got a call one day from this government agency saying, hey, we've got this eight year old boy who we're working with, he's blind. And we're, we're doing this surgery, we believe we can restore his sight, but he's in hospital every month for procedure. It's pretty tough on this kid. We'd love him to have some activity. Would you be willing to teach him music? And I'm like, absolutely. I had no idea how I was going to teach him and give him what I knew at the time. And all I could think was, well, he's blind. He can't read music. That was the only way that I knew how to teach because that was the only real music. What am I going to do? And it wasn't until that day that that, that was like in the mid nineties that it suddenly occurred to me, hang on. I wasn't reading as a kid. What was I actually doing? Wow. It took that long for you to put, put it all together. That long to actually have it be a conscious thing. Yes. Wow. That's fantastic. So I, I knew you moved over because you were teaching and you were bringing teaching to the U S and that was all good with your wife and kids. Yes? Oh, yeah. Look, I mean, my wife, um, just a, a little bit about that. Cause, uh, th this is where it gets into that, you know, d do we design our life or is there divine design behind it all? Um, I met, my wife through a mutual friend of ours, um, a girl that was a younger sister of a friend of my sister's and we were buddies and we would hang out together. And one day she said, I'm going ice skating. Do you want to come? Yes. I, she was 12. I was 13. She said, I'm going to bring a friend from school. You bring a friend from school. And I met this friend and I shook her hand and she had this smile and she just turned her head on the side. And I, the second I met her, I had this physical experience of like, I just come home. She, she had just turned 12. I had just turned 13 and I had this experience. This is from a kid who's like lives his life feeling disconnected, separated from the world, traumatized in fear, in the terror that I'm doing something wrong, doing bad things. It was almost a safety and security when I would do bad things because at least I knew I was doing something bad, but nonetheless, I got to sort of feel bad. I always felt disconnected, never really connected to people. And then I had this experience and shake her hand and it's like, Wow. I loved her from the second that I met her. And uh, we were just best friends. We would have from that day onwards and have sleepovers together. And it changed very suddenly and became a romantic interest about nine, nine years later after establishing a nine year fantastic friendship. And then, um, yeah, so that was 47 years ago, uh, 17,006 days ago. <laughs> Not that anybody's counting. Yeah, I mean, one of the ways, part of my discipline and practice, I love practices that keep me connected with appreciation. And one of them is that, you know, it's a, it's a privilege for, for those of us who've been fortunate enough to, to find someone who we love. To me, it's a privilege to be loved. Um, and there's a responsibility that I have that, that when I'm loved, that to sort of uh, honour who I can become to earn that continued love. And so I count every day because every single day matters. Um, yeah, so we've been married 35 years, but yeah, 47 years ago I met her and I've, I've loved her every single day, every single day, those 47 years. And here we are, you know, 47 years later and we still make love every day. Yes. I heard that rumor from my friend. <laughs> I'm, I love incredible. that. She is unbelievable. My Who? Wife. Your my wife? wife. Tell me about her. Well, she's 57 years of age. She's a professional confidant. She's a sex and intimacy coach. She's a clinical hypnotherapist and a trained, a trained somatic body worker and a trained tantra educator. And she's a trained somatic practitioner. She has a practice. Uh, her whole practice is in the area of sexuality. Uh, she coaches men and women and couples of all sorts of configurations and uh, deals with all ends of the spectrum. Um, you know, people that just want to know more and more skills and more knowledge. Uh, she has a particular interest in not so much getting people turned on, but starting to illuminate all of the off switches that they have turned on. So it's not really a matter of learning how to be turned on. It's more about learning how to turn off the off switches. 
that's um, sorry if that came out clumsily, but that's part of her expertise. Yeah, so Hunter has the, um, she's, she's had a lifelong dedication to her physical health and well-being since early, early childhood. So, you know, she's a 57-year-old woman that has all of the wisdom and experience from being 57 and self-employed all of her life and all of her adult life and mother of three incredible children. We have three adult children. She has the body of an athletic 20-year-old. So I go to bed with this athletic 20-year-old every night. She has the energy of a vibrant teenager and the authenticity of a child. She's completely revealed, hides nothing. And um, she, Hunter causes no harm. She just loves people and is just revealed and, you know, um, she's just extraordinary. She, she, I, I know I've never met a human being like her. She's a happy human being as flawed as all of us. Um, she has such a unique relationship with uh, her flaws. She's so, so extraordinarily self-compassionate and you can't be anything but compassionate to others when you come from that place for yourself. So you couldn't have designed a better partner. It sounds like for the struggles you've had in your life to have. It was the perfect. You know, this is where we live life forward, but we understand it backward, you know? It's like, I live every day like I am making the choices. I choose to do this, I choose to do that, I respond this way, I act this way, I wanna move in this direction, we need this to happen, what have I gotta to do to make that happen? I feel like I'm there causing it to happen. Until I get down the path a certain way and look back, and when I look back, it just feels like there was divine design going along on all along. I think it's a little bit like the surfer on the wave. The surfer's there on the board and they're doing their 360s and you know, whatever it is, and they feel like they're in control, but the wave is heading this way. <laughs> You can do what you want on the way, but the way is heading this way. So, I mean, beautiful. look, everyone's got a different interpretation and I love anyone having their own interpretation and I'm devout in everybody, everyone's right to their own interpretation. But in my world, I feel like it was absolutely divine design and that, you know, my wife and I feel as though we are masculine, fem feminine expression of one genetic composition. So, God, that's, that's awesome, Neil. That's beautiful. And um, I know because we have a mutual friend, I'd heard uh, her point of view, her perspective of your explanation of the relationship with your wife, but it's far more beautiful coming from you. Hmm. So you, you moved here, you were asked to teach this blind child, and you had learned the real way to teach music. But um, a way that made a little more sense to you than you had been taking those lessons all those years. So yeah. you said, yes, you're excited. You're taking this on. And then you realize, holy cow, I can teach him the same way I learned because I can't read the music. Yes, yeah, like, what am I going to do? And then it was like, hang on. I didn't read. What, what the heck was I doing back then? And so I just sort of sat at the piano and I, and I just began to reconstruct the way that I would do things and, and be conscious of it. And it was like, oh, I see. I'm seeing this like specific shapes. There's this, you know, the notes go in a straight line and then they do this peak and, and, a, and a, like a mountain and a straight line and then another mountain and then they come back and then it's the same sort of image reversed. It's like, I wonder if I could take a piece and break it down and show him the shapes so he could just feel those shapes put them into like into his fingers and put his fingers in position and let him feel them and so i just i was just completely winging it and so um yeah yeah and he was make, doing it making amazing progress and i thought well he's progressing so well because being without outside his ears are really compensated uh he had about three months of lessons playing a whole repertoire of contemporary and classical and some blues stuff and really amazing and uh and I said to his dad one day, after about three months of lessons, are you happy with the results? And his dad said, well, not only are we happy, but he's teaching his four-year-old sister how to play this way, and she's blind too. And that was just like a, a light bulb moment. I didn't even know what it, the light bulb was illuminating, but it was a light bulb moment, like, hang on, wow. Firstly, I thought, I wonder what would happen if I taught other young children this way, typical learners. 
started showing other children and I just started to see results that I'd never seen before. They were just immediately connected to their natural musicianship. Every single human being without exception, all human beings, zero exceptions, everybody is deeply and profoundly and naturally musical, including everybody who's convinced that they're not and everybody who had prior experience and believed that their prior experience gave evidence that they're not. It always had everything to do with the way you were taught and nothing to do with you. Everybody's musical. And what I saw was there was nothing in between these children connecting with their musicianship and they were just immediately able to play. And I thought even then, well, maybe they're doing that so well because this is so organic to me. I thought, I wonder if I could show other teachers and they could replicate it. So I, I, I was training teachers. Uh, you know, in, the, in a reading based traditional method. And so I knew teachers and I said, started to explain to them what I was doing. And they came back saying, we've never seen anything like this. Um, and so I thought, okay, I've got to, I've got to explore this. So over a period of a couple of decades, um, I developed it into this whole curriculum and would this approach, how advanced could we get with this approach and would it apply to all musical styles, contemporary and classical and gospel and blues and could we apply it to composition and improvisation and accompaniment and create a really vast broad based uh, learning experience as well as, so first of all, I developed it as a methodology, an educational methodology and philosophy and then I developed it as a system for training educators. Um, and, uh, and so primarily what I've done since um, 2000, uh, is train educators around the world who want to be licensed to teach my method exclusively. And uh, right now at the moment, I'm in the process of developing a self-study program that will, we can make available to everyone. In fact, I'm creating a whole module that I'm just going to give away as a gift to people um, that will just immediately have anybody of any age who's capable of learning, which is almost everybody, um, it'll immediately have them playing music that sounds great and, and immediately have them com composing and imp improvising. I am so excited about this because, I mean, you have 800 teachers in 13 countries, so that's a lot, but there's, it's still not enough. So, yeah, not the tip of the surface. right. So you can continue to do that, but then the self-study opens it up to everybody, everywhere, everyone, right. um, which is fantastic. So, yeah. Did you split off from the person who taught you in Australia, the method that you yeah, were? Yeah, I mean, really what happened after that experience with um, the, the blind boy, Wade, and as I began developing it, I really started to see that not only was, you know, um, what I call a playing-based approach more appropriate, I started to see that the very thing that was in the way of students, music has the highest failure rate of any taught subject like the vast, just in the US alone, there's about 7 million children having private piano lessons like this week and next week, almost all of them will never learn to play. Almost all of them will be turned off music. Almost all of them will stop having piano lessons the day their parents stop forcing them to have piano lessons. It's really, it's horrific. You know, when you have a humanity that is so profoundly musical, uh, but not having access to musical self-expression, I think that that has um, a consciousness consequence that's almost beyond our capability to measure. Huge global consequence to have a musical being not be musically self-expressed. So part of what, I mean, really this is what this is about for me. It's how do I cause a breakthrough in creativity for, for humanity using music as a means. Which I think is one of the most natural forms of self-expression, having children myself, you know, um, I have video of a sick, one of my kids at six or seven months pushing the same demo button on a keyboard because she liked to dance to it or, you know, my, this, our seven-year-old spinning around in the kitchen. They don't even realize that there's social norms involved with how you look or how loud you are or that you're expressing yourself. It's just a natural expression of who they are internally coming out through music. So Absolutely, I'm 100% on board with that one. And that at some point we realize we're conscious that it's maybe embarrassing or we shouldn't act that way or we shouldn't do that because there's a bunch of adults who aren't allowing themselves to express themselves musically. And then I hear all these stories about people going through traumatic events and what's one of the modalities that healed you? Music comes up the most, but it's very self-contained. It's not expressed outwardly. So love this. So Neil, you have an amazing adventure and story, 
And I'm really thankful that you shared it. And anybody can now, if they find you on simplymusic.com, when is, when is this going to start happening? Uh, this, well, are you talking the self-study program? The self-study program. Yes. Um, well, we're, in, we're in the midst of the preparation of that right at the moment. So I, I'm a little reluctant to give a date. It'll certainly be this year. Um, yeah, it'll certainly be this year. Okay, so people can continue to watch that. I know you're on every social media, basically, platform. We can find you on Facebook, but um, mm -hmm. I know simplymusic.com was the easiest way to find that. And uh, you're very open to people asking you questions. Yes. yes. So uh, I, I know because I'm one of them. Um, so I appreciate that. And I really appreciate you sharing more details of your personal story and struggle and how that all ties in. And you were right the day that they took everything away from you. Yes. About, yes, do what you love and the money will follow instead of get the money to do what you love. So, yeah. well, you know, I mean, it goes into that whole lot of the story too of like, what was it like building a business? But that's a conversation for another day because we have had high peaks and low, long, deep valleys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's success is an instant. <laughs> For sure. I really, really appreciate you and your time. You can find me on jentaylor.net. You can find Neil Moore on simplymusic.com. You can connect with either one of us to get in touch with either one of us, pretty much. And um, Neil, I thank you so much for your time today. Thanks so much, Jen. Pleasure speaking with you. And thanks for your patience in my long answers and responses. I, they're my favorite. So you're, you're, you're one of my favorite interviews. <laughs> thank you, love. Thank you so much for listening in to Jen Taylor Rerouting. Like, share, and of course, comment. I welcome input with attitude. Get a copy of my book on Amazon, Hello, My Name is Warrior Princess, or check out my website, jentaylor.net. And if you still want more, sign up for one of my coaching packages.